All right, good morning, everyone. All right, let's get right back to where we left off. We're taking a look at Jesus' example. I'm uh, kind of focusing uh, not only on Jesus' example, but how his example is also lived out in the examples of his followers, and then we'll conclude back with Jesus' living. We started, of course, with the Great Commission. We talked about the idea that this is for all Christians, for all time. This is about discipling. We talked about um, the idea that uh, disciple-making doesn't just end with baptism. We'll see that here in just a second back in Titus 2 where we left off Wednesday night. But disciple-making also includes after we've come into the fold of Christ. We looked at Matthew 10, and I, we called it the limited commission. So these were the three things we pointed out, the diversity of the apostles, what that looks like for us because we're all disciple-makers. In a way, I might be able to reach someone, AJ might be able to hit someone else that I couldn't reach, and so forth with the whole body, that idea. We talked about going where you are. With the apostles, they were home. We think uh, being mission-minded means going to Africa or something like that. Yeah, it includes that, but we're talking about also just being able to proclaim at home, which is the third point, proclaim and demonstrate. And that's where we left off Wednesday night. And remember, we talked about to proclaim the kingdom uh, that doesn't mean to convince someone. It doesn't mean to convince. If, uh, you know, if Jeff comes back in here and says, Caleb, you and Kendall's car is on fire, I'm not going to say, you've got to convince me. I'm going to believe that proclamation. I'm going to go check it out. That's what we're talking about here, just to proclaim and demonstrate. You've got to have both. So let's read Titus 2. This is where we left off with the, in verse 10. We talked about uh, being able to adorn the doctrine which I found to be a very interesting language, or choice of words by Paul. I got the mic, so I'm going to go ahead and start in verse 1, obviously. Paul says, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in the faith, and love, steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They're to teach what is good and to train young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters, in everything, they are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So, quick note before we move on. I notice here that it's talking with older men and older women to train uh, younger men and younger women. This includes, or I would include it with, disciple-making. Because remember, we said it doesn't end with baptism. That's the end goal of evangelism. But in regards to everyone, uh, Matthew 20 says to keep going on, and teaching to uh, have them obey everything that God commands. This is seen in action. So my quick word of encouragement before we get moving on to the older people, you see me doing something good, maybe encourage me. You see me doing something bad, Maybe try and come and kindly correct me and help me out. And likewise, the whole point is the body ought to be able to edify and disciple one another. Why? Well, at the very end, this is where we left off Wednesday night, so that we may adorn the doctrine. So, adorn the doctrine. This is kind of like what Jesus talked about in Matthew 5, when he said, you're the light of the world. I think I have a slide for that one. I do. He says, you are the light of the world. And he says, when you do good works, does it glorify me? No, he says, when people see your good works, they'll glorify God. That's the idea of, as Paul says, to adorn the doctrine. And that tied in with Matthew 10 and Jesus' life and the apostles. They were going around. We don't have this today. But they were using miracles that was uh, demonstrating the kingdom. In the same way, our good works will demonstrate the kingdom. Do you understand what we're saying here? Good works demonstrate the kingdom, but it has to be tied in with 
proclaiming. So when it comes to demonstrating, okay, we're going to go back to the group discussion. I'll give you just a couple minutes. I know you can say out the gate, well, I don't use swear words, okay, for some work environments that might get people's attention, but think a little deeper. What are some ways that we can demonstrate the kingdom of God, as we talked about this, going out in your everyday life? Think about the people you run into just about every day, work, home, wherever it is, lost people you know of. Think how we can demonstrate that uh, to adorn the doctrine every day. All right, I'll give you just a couple minutes to discuss it, and then we'll start with that section and then come this way. So give you a couple minutes, and you can talk very loud so people can hear you. Don't worry about it. And by the way, you guys keep talking, discussing with each other. If you're on Facebook and you got a question, comment, or uh, want to add to the discussion here, put it on uh, Facebook, and we'll try and get that to you. George, I didn't talk to you beforehand, but yeah, he's giving me a thumbs up. Good to go. All right, discuss. How can we adorn the doctrine in our daily lives? All right, like a 30-second wrap-up warning. All right, so we talked, uh, we're talking about adorning the doctrine. You might be thinking about Jesus living, of course. Uh, we'll see if anyone over on this side of the room has an idea. How can we demonstrate the kingdom? A life. Anyone on this side? We've stumped everyone over here. Anyone over? Everyone here in the middle section? What would what we talk about? To how we can demonstrate small things on a day-to-day -day life at work or with your friends in the back, Irene. Okay. Okay, we just had uh, at a restaurant, easy opportunity for people to see a good work, a spiritual life, is to pray before a meal. And especially, I'll tell you this much, in California, I've had a, a handful of waiters and waitresses say, hey, I noticed you prayed before your meal, and I opened up a discussion. Maybe here in Texas, that's like whatever, but at least out there, it grabbed someone's attention. So praying before meals, that's a good one. Any other thoughts, how we can demonstrate day to day? Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so we had acknowledging Christ or uh, giving, um, giving credit to God and instead of saying I got lucky with this job or we were lucky that, uh, that we had a healthy child that was born. Okay, Christian ought to give glory to God and we're thankful to God that everything was all right or God blessed me with this. That's a good one. And then the other one you brought up was removing self, the Philippians 2, 3 principle of considering others more important than yourself. Uh, I remember my mom told me growing up, kill them with kindness, which you don't like to hear when you're in eighth grade and that soccer game or recess means all the world. You're like, what are you saying, mom? You're like, I got to win. Um, but it definitely hit kids, especially when I got older and became a Christian in my later high school days where someone was just rude for no reason. You might see that on the road. You might see that face to face. Probably some pain behind that to some degree when they see you just hitting them with care and love and going out of your way, turning the other cheek, as Jesus says, that'll grab a lot of people's attention. At least stop and make them consider. All right, so we've had a few answers taken up. Any thoughts over here from this section on the day-to-day -day life, how we can adorn the doctrine? Right now, we've got praying for food, acknowledging Christ, giving God credit, putting others first, even if it's hard. AJ? Uh, Mm -hmm. I like that. So AJ just said, hey, uh, in a work environment especially, I know it happens in school as well, um, move away from the gossip, an easy one. I realized in my life, I got into is complaining. It's easy to complain if your college has bad food or whatnot to whatever it may be. It's really easy for us to whine, and you don't think much about it. But what you're really telling God is, what you've given me is not good enough. Which, when you put it in those terms, it's a lot more serious. And when I visited here last fall, I did one about being thankful and content and brought up 1 Corinthians 10. And that one gets me because it talks about the sins that Israel committed out in the wilderness. It's like idolatry. Like, yeah terrible sexual morality. You're like, oh my goodness, you're like, so bad. And it's like, and they complain. You're like, who cares? And you're like, why, why, was, why would that matter? And I was like, no, it's a big deal to complain and say, you know, the giver is not giving me enough. That's a really good one. And the, I like that idea also of joy. Joy. That everything God is for me brings me joy. Not my stuff or relationships. That can bring greater joy in your life that God gives you. But your ultimate foundation, your source of joy would be God. All right, any last thoughts on how we can demonstrate the doctrine? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes. So, yeah. so I like what you're saying about denying self and the Beatitudes. That's right. That comes in the context of uh, being a light. It's funny, you know, myself going to, you know, getting an education in the Bible, or we come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I talked about this last Wednesday that we should be doers, not hearers only. We hear the word a lot. You're going to church, you hear the word a lot. It's important that we take this from an academic, knowledge based uh, lesson and take that bridge across from academics to practical, real life. All right, those are some good uh, discussion and comments. I want you all to share that with each other because remember, I want this to be clear we can't only demonstrate and not proclaim, right? And vice versa, I cannot, you know, only proclaim. If I'm like, hey, you, you start working on someone's spiritual conversation, or say I'm a Christian, but then my life is just that. It is unchristian. It is 
unchristlike. And I see this all the time where we separate good works from proclamation all the time. Here's a true story out in California. Um, church, they wanted to get the members involved in the local community. Okay, I hear that. Sounds like a good idea. They called it a ministry fair. It wasn't like an actual carnival or something like that. The idea was they had individual Christians out there who had to work like with an orphanage. And there was another one that would raise money and send goods to Africa. And there was another one that out there went to a soup kitchen. But amongst these good work tables was an evangelism table. Now, can anyone tell me the problem with that picture? You think? I think some of you are probably feeling the problem with that picture. The problem was, we were saying, go to the soup kitchen, but that is separate from the evangelism table. That's the problem. When we say we're going to do good works, and I'll use the soup kitchen for a good example. If Caleb goes to the soup kitchen, I ladle soup for everyone, I help them clean up, whatever it may be, whatever other good work you can think of. And people are like, thanks, you're so generous, you're so kind. You're like, oh, don't worry about it. Caleb's not so great or so kind. That would be an opportunity to say, well, I do this because of what God tells me to do. And with those people, that's a nice thing to give someone food who doesn't have it. That's a good thing that Christians should be involved in. But did I make an eternal impact there? Or did I just give them the soup and then said, move along? And then that is kind of a pat on the back of, okay, I did that. Check. Hey, I heard this a few years ago in a sermon. It stuck with me. I hope it sticks with you. Okay, good works without proclamation of Jesus Christ. That is self-promotion. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm doing. But I don't share with anyone the good news. And vice versa. If I have proclamation of Jesus Christ, but I do not have good works, now that's hypocrisy. So we need to make sure that we are not separating, adorning the doctrine, as well as what Jesus teaches and lives, proclaiming the gospel. You can't separate those two. It's a big problem to do that. And I see it, and it sneaks into my life and all our lives very easily. But good works without proclamation of Christ, self-promotion, and proclamation of Jesus without good works is hypocrisy. It's got to be intertwined. So we've talked about how the Great Commission's for us, and that we want a culture from evangelism to disciple-making. We want a culture in our church of disciple-making. And we saw the example in Matthew 10, proclaiming and demonstrating. But I also want to further push the minutes we got left, how we view ourselves. I want us to view us the way Jesus would view us and the way that Jesus lives. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 5. You remember Paul, of course, uh, he wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians. Based after seeing a risen Jesus, talked about that Sunday night. I'm starting in verse 17. Paul says, if anyone's in Christ, if you're a baptized believer, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through God reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So in our own life, we see salvation is God's work, not my own. And even when we go out, it says, Paul's peaks of here, and that we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And at the end of verse 20, it says, God is making an appeal through us. This is why I started with Wednesday night. Not our own work. This is God doing it. He'll use us to meet that tool. But look at verse 18. I guess I'll call it 18b, the second half of verse 18. It says, we're reconciled to himself, to Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 19, again, we have that same idea, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Okay, when you hear the word reconciliation, what do you think of? Hey, you hear reconciliation, what do you think that means? What do you say, David? Correction. Correction. Okay, yeah, correction in the world. Yeah, I see that. Any other thoughts? Yep. You were separated. Okay. One last thought on reconciliation. 
Okay, we got a, a correction. I definitely feel that correction, like in the relationship. A reconciliation showing that we know, we see that in the Old Testament, sin divides us. Uh, kind of made up my own definition of it, talking about like peace, uh, peace between us, mankind, and God. That's done only through Jesus. And by the way, if you're looking for an easy way to make a proclamation, I think uh, 2 Cor 5.21 is a good one, that God took Jesus who knew no sin and made him to become sin in our place. That's a pretty good one to proclaim. Uh, Google said it's the restoration, the correction of like friendly relations, yeah? We're reconciled to God. But then, so we have this ministry. Minister means to serve. Okay, we have this ministry of reconciliation. Okay, and then Paul says he's an ambassador for Christ. Okay, just academically, what's an ambassador? Anyone recall? What is an ambassador? What do you think of? A spokesperson? Okay, yeah, that's a good one. What'd you say? A representative. Bingo. We got a spokesman, a representative. I pulled this straight out of Webster's. Sorry, I'm banging the mic a lot. It says an accredited diplomat sent by a country as its official representative of a foreign country. I represent the U.S., I go to Brazil or whatever, I am their ambassador. Yes. I can go to foreign country there. I am say what I want to say. Right. Yes, so we're talking about having uh, the authority of God actually approving of this ambassador. Because there are a lot of people who will claim to be speaking for Christ. We're going to have to go to the scriptures to figure out who really is. Okay, so if you start viewing yourself as an ambassador, that kind of starts to change your mindset, doesn't it? And the mission-minded day-to-day. Let me try and further change that mindset with one last passage, and then we'll look at Jesus to close out. So 1 Peter chapter 2, we're just going to look at verses 4 through 9. Uh, Peter's talking about Jesus. Here's someone who lived with him for three years, roughly. He says, as you come to him, as you come to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, he's chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It goes into prophecy, for it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, as whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who don't believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we're God's possession. That's talking about giving the authority, of course, of what we are to do. But it really stands out to me that he says in verse 5 here, the spiritual house to do what? To be a holy priesthood. And in verse 9, he says you're a royal priesthood. And then it sounds very great commission like, says that you may proclaim, there's that word again, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his light. So Peter's saying, disciples of Jesus, they're this royal or this holy priesthood. All right. So when you think about being a priest, that's a big task under the law of Moses. Got to be a male from the tribe of Levi. But pretend that's you. What would it have been like to have been a priest under the law of Moses? And the point of this question is to start putting us within the mindset of a priest in their day-to-day life. Because Peter's saying as a Christian... We're part of this holy or royal priesthood as the church. Okay, think practically and spiritually. I'll give you just a couple minutes to discuss 
What would that have been like to have been a priest under the old law? And think about how that changes your mindset now as a Christian. All right, give you just a couple minutes. All right, what are some thoughts that we had out there of uh, what would have been like to have been a priest in the Old Testament? You're pretending you're a male from the tribe of Levi. Um, any thoughts on this side of the room over here? Any thoughts over here? I include the middle section. Yeah. That's a really good one. We discussed that in our front group here. Uh, what he's saying is, do we still view God as holy? You think about the purification process for the priests, and it was quite the ordeal. And I was just talking with my group, extra biblically, but tradition states that they would bathe and all that behind a translucent uh, curtain so they could see the silhouette, so they could make sure that the high priest, when he was going back there in the Holy of Holies, was clean. 
and that they tie a rope around him. This is extra biblical. This is historical, but they they tie a rope around him to go in the Holy of Holies in case he wasn't pure, and if he died, they could pull him out without anyone going back behind that curtain. And that's uh, a danger consideration for ourselves. Do we treat worship and our day-to-day life pretty whatever? We brought up the Lord's Supper, and we say, hey, don't take this in an unworthy manner. Paul says that straight out. He says, for this reason, the reason why people um, are sick or seemingly dying, I don't know if that's for all time, maybe, he's saying is, well, because you're taking it in an unworthy manner. Do we still treat God as holy? So we should definitely be thinking about that idea. We're about to worship Wow, it's 10 o'clock in just a few minutes. Any other comments on what would it have been like to have been a priest? We just talked about purification and viewing God as holy. Any other thoughts? Yeah. It would be a huge honor. An honor? Yeah. So having a huge honor as a Christian, we have the honor today, it says a royal priesthood, because we inherit that as children of God now when we're in Christ. That's something very special and something not to trample on. Okay, one last comment, anyone? Exhausting. Talk about it would be exhausting. I thought practically out the gate of all these rituals and things I have to live up to and people look to me. And then on top of that, um, all the sacrifices. I mean, absolute, a literal mess. A really graphic mess to be a part of. So there's this burden. Practically speaking, and you're tired. Spiritually speaking, you're representing a lot of people. Um, there is an honor to it, but we don't want to trample on the honor. Do we still view God as holy? Those are all good, and it should help us view ourselves when we think of ourselves as a holy priesthood, from worship to what we're talking about in our living and proclaiming that. That ought to change our mindset and how we view ourselves, because that's how Jesus is saying we ought to live. And you think of the book of Hebrews, some deeper theology quickly, you know, Jesus is our high priest. But Jesus, when we talk about representing someone, he comes in the flesh, he represents the Father, does he not? He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, but he's also representing God the Father, so Jesus meets us too. He's an ambassador. Okay, Paul talks about that idea of being an ambassador. And of course, Jesus is high priest. He's our high priest. That rips the curtain so we have access to the Father. Then we're called to this holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices. So we want the same mission as Jesus. I would call this Jesus' mission statement. As an ambassador and high priest, Jesus says, here's my mission. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And we talk about this almost every week. The word Christian means to be Christ-like. Are we like Jesus in this aspect and seeking and saving the lost and offering spiritual sacrifice? We talked about this kind of uh, already, but quick review. We want to view ourselves as ambassadors, and we want to view ourselves as a holy priesthood. And the big thing is Christians often look at our relationship to God as consumers, and not co-workers. And I, remember we talked about that. We should be thankful. God's given us a lot. Look where we're sitting right now. Okay, God has given us a lot. Don't, uh, don't forget to be grateful. But when we just view as give, 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 and not co-working, not going out for the Lord, that's, that's definitely an issue. So for the sake of time, really quickly go through this. Just one question each, or one answer. Hey, what's the mindset of a priest towards God? We've kind of talked about that idea taking it very seriously that I'm representing the people and sacrifices. And then I'll ask this question to be answered from you. What actions does this mindset as an ambassador, as a priest, what does this inspire in you? Are we viewing ourselves a little differently? Any thoughts when it comes to worship or evangelism or the Christian life, this mindset of being a priest, what does that inspire in you? Hard work, okay? As an ambassador, as a priest, there is work to be done. Any other comment? Nate? A person serves, especially as a loyal priest, but for the present king, and for the king, first for the king, has got to change the mindset.
Tell me. Humble. That's a good one, too. So we're talking about hard work. Nate brought up this changing. I said this mindset, not just a pew sitter, but I'm an ambassador. I'm a priest, which involves hard work. But in all that, you think if you were a priest, we talked about you went both ways, Tony. It would be an honor. It is a great honor to be a child of God. What a blessing that is. But to think I'm better than my brethren or even better than lost people, well, you'd be the same lost person if it weren't for Christ. You didn't do anything. You'd be that same lost person to be humble with that aspect. So if we view it as an honor, view it as hard work and changing our mindset, and yet we're humble, we're going to want to actually see some real-life change outside, including of just uh, like where we discuss it academically in class or you hear it in a sermon now. So we got just a few minutes left. Okay, we talked about, this was our closing Wednesday night, and the whole goal I wanted this morning was for us to start changing our mindset, our view of how we see ourselves as not just consumers, but as co-workers, what we're called to do in regards to the Great Commission, as well as purging and edifying and even kindly rebuking each other as part of the disciple-making process. But right before Matthew 10, I want to focus on that as we close out. Before Jesus sends out the 12, there's something he teaches and does. So turn over to Matthew chapter 9. Look at the last few verses in Matthew 9. This is right before he sends out this limited commission. So we start off by saying Jesus doing what we saw the 12 do in chapter 10 and what we're commanded to do today. It says Jesus went out through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and here it is, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And here is demonstration. He's healing every disease and every affliction. So he's proclaiming a word and deed. In verse 36, Jesus sees the crowds, and he had compassion for them because they're harassed, and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So, when I look at verse 36, Jesus having compassion on the people, do we see lost people when I talked about that mindset of your day-to-day -day life? And it's easy. I'm with you. I've experienced it myself. Everyone has. It's easy to get into the routine of, this is my coworker, this is my boss, this is my subordinate, that's my neighbor, that's my mailman or mailwoman, whatever it is. You get used to just, that's, that's all they are. They're this worker. They're that person that serves you, that gives you your chicken through the window at Chick-fil-A, whatever it is. That, that's all we view them as, and we're all, all of us are guilty of doing that. But when we start changing our mindset, like we've been talking on, how God views us, how Jesus wants us to live, how he lived, do we see lost people? Because if we see lost people, now we're going to have compassion the way Jesus did. Because we may say lost people, and you don't want to have this response to say, well, I don't care that I see lost people. And that makes me think of Jonah. And then we're Jonah. He said, I don't want to go preach repentance to Nineveh. I don't want that. Why? Well, partially he was scared for his own life, but he says why in chapter 4. He's like, I knew you'd forgive him, God. That's a rotten heart. That's a really rotten heart. And I understand. You see prayers of uh, lamentation and whatnot and judgment in the Psalms and the Old Testament, some very strong language used. Okay? I get that. But if I look at someone... And you think of someone, you know, you think of the farthest person that is the opposite of you as far as you can in the LGBT community. You think of someone like that or someone who's just out partying all the time. You look at them and we kind of have this mindset of, I'm better than you. You're lost. Don't even bother. If you think, don't even bother that it's throwing, you know, swines or throwing uh, pearls before swine. Well, you first have to throw the pearls or throw the seed out there to find out. It's pretty judgmental to think that person's not going to repent and then not share the gospel. That's the same rotten attitude that Jonah had. And he was very happy to watch Nineveh be destroyed, even after they repented. That's something we have to consider. And in verse 38, it says, Pray earnestly to send out laborers. Which, by the way, as you see on the screen, it's going to be us. The ambassadors for Christ, and those who are a royal or holy priesthood. 
So I'm going to take this one step further because we said we don't want this to just be academic. We don't. So find someone sitting by you. I want you to talk with them for just a minute. I want you to find someone sitting close to you. And for this week, here's the homework. Oh, no, I got homework. I hated homework as a kid. I was talking about Wednesday night. I remember my first homework. I was in kindergarten. I remember sitting down at the table. I'm like five years old. I hated that idea. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I remember that. Random thought from Caleb. There you go. Back to the important thing I was saying. Here's the homework this week. Find someone sitting by you. Look to them. If you don't have their phone number, you probably should have their phone number. Maybe encourage them every day. But I want us to pray for someone specifically, other than ourselves, that's sitting by you right now, that God would open opportunities that a laborer may go out into the harvest. So let's give you a minute or two, find someone sent by it, exchange phone numbers if you don't have it already. I want us to actually put this in real life practice. This is, easy. this is the easy part, this is step one. I'm not even getting to the evangelism yet. This is step one, to so just simply pray for a brother or sister. And I bet you, if you pray in your own life and for someone else, that you pray for opportunities to come out, you're gonna see opportunities. God will answer those prayers. So let's find someone to pray for right now, and then we'll close out with one last thought because the bell has already rung. All right, second bell just rang. You can keep talking quietly if you're still exchanging numbers and whatnot. Okay, the idea I want us to go out here, if you haven't seen, is to take this from academically understanding it and getting out there and start doing it. A good way to start doing it is start praying for each other that we have opportunities to do just that, to share the gospel. And then we just had the second bell uh, rung. Wednesday night, we're going to take a look at a, a really great example of Jesus' evangelism, and we're going to focus all on the story of Jesus, break that down, because yes, there's proclamation, but after proclamation, if you get a question or interest, we're going to have to sit down and connect and reason over the scriptures. So before we dismiss, I'd like to say a prayer with everyone as we start this idea of praying for each other and going and doing and fulfilling that commission. All right, let's all pray together. God, we're so thankful for your mercy and love. It's evident in every day the fact that the sun even rose on this country and this world, the sinful world, 
it is truly your will to wait for us all to repent. It is your will that we not be separated from you. We pray that you may use us to complete your will, O Father, for you've commanded us to be examples and lights in a dark world. Help us to demonstrate and proclaim, not to just do one or the other, Father. Uh, we pray right now, as we're going to go into a week, we want to look for opportunities to just simply proclaim that you are king and that we are forgiven in your name and that people may see our good works and glorify you. Uh, we pray for fellowship. This is truly what the fellowship of Christians is, is to share and dwell and have communion in you, O oh Jesus. We pray that uh, we change our view set to be ambassadors for you in our life and all our decisions. And we pray, O oh Father, that we see ourselves as a royal or holy priesthood, as right now we're about to come to you in worship. Let us not take that lightly. I thank you for this church, Father, and for the love and fellowship that we have. We pray that we may fulfill your duty by the hand of your work, for it is your doing. And it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. 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 All right. You're dismissed.